I'd like in a moment to introduce my uh, um, colleagues on the panel um, today. As you can see, we've got a great lineup, um, and they will introduce themselves in just a moment. But we're here today to talk about the uh, uh, first 100 days, the ACT's guide to the first 100 days as a treasurer. And you can see an image on the screen, hopefully now, that's um, of, of the um, uh, booklet, which is in a print and PDF form. And you can see where you can download uh, that uh, guide. So um, that's just to um, uh, uh, make sure that you know how to access it. But without further ado, I'm going to ask each of my panelists to say a little word about their background, their current role, and um, why they think the guide is an important document in the Treasurer's Toolkit. So if I could start um, with, with Frank, please. Good day from my side. Um, this is uh, Frank Vector speaking. Um, I'm working with Puma, number three sports manufacturer um, and sportswear company in the world, um, with a history dating back into 1948. Um, I'm responsible for all treasury and insurance uh, topics within the Puma Group, and I'm an active member in the German um, Treasury Association, and supported, just as a recent example, um, one initiative, uh, the so-called Summer School, um, where the association um, hosted in Frankfurt School of Finance um, a couple of master students um, to get them familiar with the job profile of a treasurer. And that is bringing me to your second question, Caroline. Um, why is this an important document for me? Um, and uh, I, I have to first congratulate uh, Claudia and Caroline, who were the main persons behind this document, um, because what has been brought uh, on the table here is really amazing. Um, and a very, very good uh, guide into that. Um, and for me, it shows that, first of all, the senior treasurer's role is a rewarding and interesting one. Um, you can see the spectrum over there. Um, so, um, and uh, to fulfill this role, you need to have a, a relatively wide view and, of course, a um, good network. Um, which um, you can find in the ACT, in treasurer's or organizations, or in other networks. Um, and that should help the newbie in this role um, to survive and not to panic. That's it from my side for the first question. Thank you. Thanks very much, Frank. I'll just turn to Simon now uh, to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Caroline. Um, my name is Simon Neville. I'm the group treasurer of Reckitt Benkiser, which is a consumer goods company. Uh, brands that you may have heard of, Dettol, Finnish, uh, Calgon, Eurofin, so I'll, I'll put a plug there. My background is in uh, accounting, and I kind of became a treasurer almost accidentally um, a long time ago now when I was asked to, uh, to form a new operational treasury function for Sainsbury's. Um, and I wish, frankly, one of these guides had been around at that stage because I, I really probably didn't have much of a clue um, what I was doing. But I also realised it was a, a relatively new profession at that time. And, um, and therefore, you kind of made it up as you go along. So this guide is very helpful. Thanks, Simon. I'll just turn to Claudia now uh, for her introductions. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I am a director in cash management and structuring at Deutsche Bank. The structuring team are the treasury advisors of the bank. Our job is to be uh, well informed about the latest trends, challenges, and technologies in treasury to then be able to advise our clients on best practices. Um, this role is very suitable for me as structuring tries to speak the language of the client. And I had been a treasury pra practitioner myself until one year ago. So uh, before joining Deutsche Bank, uh, I worked for about 15 years in the finance function in, in the Treasury Department of large MNCs. And well, we know each other from, uh, I am the uh, ambassador of the Association of Corporate Treasuries in Singapore. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Claudia. And, and just from the bank's point of view, um, and your personal point of view, of course, as well, why did you think to approach the ACT with this project and, and why you felt it's important at this time? Um, well, when I joined the bank uh, last year, uh, some of my first engagement uh, was to coach new treasurers. So uh, I was lucky to be working with some uh, senior managers that had just joined the function. Some of them uh, were from 
not from the a treasury background. Uh, they they were sometimes accountants, auditors, or even bankers. And as I had just recently joined Deutsche Bank, I realized that you know, even if if we work with the same stuff. Uh, we don't necessarily uh, we have the same vocabulary. We refer to different things when we are talking. So um, when I was talking to my clients, um, they were looking for um, ideas on how to start, how to prioritize, how to uh, evaluate what needed to be done, which changes were urgent, uh, what their agenda should be. And um, we realized that uh, some of these clients even on these conversations, they were shy to ask uh, some of the basic questions. And um, we they did some research in the market, and we saw that there was a big gap. There was not um, such a document that treasurers can refer, could refer to. And that's when we decided to uh, approach a recognized training body to help us uh, fill this gap. So and I, I must say I'm very proud of this, uh, of, of the achievement, yeah. Oh, and, and and you do right to be proud. It was great. It was almost I, I think maybe serendipitous is is the right word because at the ACT we've been looking at the very same question. We've been um, analysing uh, the, the the treasures out there in terms of different personas, and we had identified um, what we sometimes call the accidental treasure, the the treasure who suddenly finds that in the treasury role but hadn't necessarily planned it. And um, and we were thinking, how can we help that particular group? So it was perfect timing from both sides. And as you say, we, we hoped for a, a gap. Um, and so just then moving back to our um, treasurers on the uh, on the line, if I, I could ask um, Frank, you know, first of all, to thank you both for the various nuggets of advice and information you provided for the publication. And for those um, reading through it, you'll see that a number of treasurers have given their thoughts on their first hundred days or looking back how they reflect on, on their career in Treasury. So um, just just turning, as I say, to first of all, I'll start with Frank. Um, you know, why would you, from a treasurer's perspective, uh, see this as an important document? Well, um, we already talked about this accidental treasurers, and I have to admit, uh, I'm also one of these individuals uh, getting in uh, uh, accidentally. I came in from a consulting um, a perspective, um, which was at that time for corporate treasury a relatively young one, and then they took bankers um, to get to get into that, um, um, to get to form a corporate treasury consulting um, practice. Um, so that's why I get into that. And, and uh, this was also the driver of this summer school I, I mentioned already before for the German Treasurers Association, where, uh, where, we re where we recognize that there are only quite limited possibilities for a university education of young people or other possibilities of, of, of education for these people. And when these people and when these individuals progress in their career, um, and getting senior treasurers, they also lack often possibilities for professional association. And this guide, and that's why I think this is an important one, um, provides you a kind of an easy to read 64 page um, document, which giving really a comprehensive pre-read about what senior treasurer is dealing with and what makes our profession nice and, 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 and a good choice um, as a profession, at least for me. Indeed. Well, very well put, Frank. Uh, Simon, why would you um, see it as an important document? I think for similar reasons, actually, to, um, to those Frank outlined. I mean, I, I say, as I mentioned earlier, I was also a sort of an accidental treasurer where I moved from a, an accounting discipline, albeit looking at cash flows, into treasury. Um, and, and I think this gives a good framework. I think it gives the, the key topic areas that you need to, to go through. It's, you know, it is concise, it's a good checklist, um, but also to recognize that maybe not everybody will deal with everything that's in the guide, depending on the size of their organization. It, it helps you sort of navigate where you have gaps in your, in your CPD or in your education professionally. Uh, inevitably, when you, when you go into some of the subjects like debt capital markets, one just goes into a huge amount of detail for the transaction, almost engages with it and then disengages once the transaction is um, is done, and then it's more of a question of managing the process going forward. But I think it's um, you know it, it's a really strong sort of document to to put together. So it, it's good to see it out there, to be honest. 
Thanks, Simon. And, and do you have a particular section that's a favourite or one that you'd recommend everyone read? <laughs> well, you know, you know, Caroline, I've read this from cover to cover probably three or four times now. No, but seriously, um, I think the strategic section is probably the most important. I know it, I know it kind of comes first in the guide, but I think unless you know what sort of policy framework and what risk framework you're going to be operating within to, to ensure that the, the board's appetite for risk is the same as, if you like, the CFOs um, and your own, it, it would make managing banks a lot easier if you do that up front. So I think it's, uh, for me, it's, it's very important because I think if you don't, if you don't know that, you can, you can either lead banks on into transactions that you know you won't be asked to do over with the board and you just waste a lot of time. So I think thinking through that quite clearly is is really important. I mean, in my own role, uh, this is an area we look at every year in a formal way with the audit committee, uh, where and you know me and my team will get together. In fact, I think later next month, uh, and just turn the pages and, and make sure that we've not observed anything where this is either hampering our performance or indeed areas where we can augment our performance. So for me, it's. It's a super important sort of uh, section. Um, a very good point. Now, being joined up, it's amazing how some organisations don't uh, kind of join the dots and are, are, are heading in different directions. So, absolutely critical, as you say. And um, uh, Frank, do you do you have a particular favourite? Uh, I, I do have to admit, I even have two. Um, one is a bit on an obvious one, and the other one is a bit a cynical one. And starting with the obvious one, um, the obvious one is that. Um, where we are going into the uh, into the uh, new role and availability of technology. Um, that is, of course, when, when I go back into where I started Treasury 20 years ago, um, that is a completely different exercise now. Um, and, and with every hire we are doing in our department, with everything we are doing in our department, we still focus on technology, 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 because otherwise we wouldn't be able to cope with all the requirements in that regard. Um, and I would not only take it as a kind of a, there are broad availabilities. I think in Treasury in the last five, six, seven years, we have a technology revolution um, and, and not only broader. Um, and the cynical one um, uh, is a special insight about corporate failures. Um, and the important thing is that you learn out of these failures. Um, uh, because uh, otherwise uh, you, uh, you 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 are uh, you will lose your job, um, but 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 it shows um, how how sad examples um, uh, or, or, or it shows on these sad examples how important the role is really with treasury, um, and why our profession has to keep eyes and minds wide open um, to be on 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 the hood. Um, and to be on, on, on alert um, what is going on in your uh, company. And that is also one thing, one, one, one very uh, strong advice I would like to give. You have to understand your business. You have to keep the eyes on your business wide open um, because otherwise you are tapping into this corporate failure role um, and get an, getting another example of these sad um, things uh, they are reported in the next um, in the next uh, uh, update for this uh, 100 days. Indeed, indeed. And yeah, absolutely, the, the treasurer's role is so critical at the heart of, of the business and really understanding it and um, doing um, one's job to the best of one's ability is, is really important. And you, you mentioned, um, and again, thank you both for your, your, your help with the guide and your, your, your excellent um, quotes and anecdotes. But you, you mentioned, Frank, you said, um, never say never to a scenario which tells you that the world is shutting down and any business comes to a nearly complete stop. Welcome to the COVID-19 world and the massive impacts Treasury leaders have to deal with. I just wondered if you'd like to expand on that a little more, Frank. Well, uh, if, you look at, if you look back into this guide, uh, which I have at least as a printout in, in front of me, um, the, uh, page 30 um, is starting um, with the cash flow forecasting. And it is written how this is done, how important that is, how um, technologies help you with this forward-looking discipline, and and that uh, uh, the discussing the, of the cash flow forecast with your colleague with your colleagues should talk ranges. The, the COVID nineteen for us showed um, that we call it fat tail risks. 
Well, these ranges um, from a normal distribution um, are, are that, what, what, what happened. Um, we have a shutdown of 80% of, of the business in the whole world. And, and if, if that is not a fat tail, I don't know what a fat tail is. Um, and, and, and in this regard, um, it is important that the company, the liquidity situation, the credit line situation, um, is prepared to also cope with these fat tails or to use a more scenario-driven world um, to, to be able to survive if you can afford really the worst worst case scenario. Um, and that is what, what, what tells us this and, and, and where we were so busy in the last months. Absolutely. And, and you touched on something um, that I've, um, since my Unilever days, that I've been uh, very much passionate about is that looking at ranges um, rather than a single point forecast, which isn't terribly helpful. But as you say, then um, the normal probability curves um, don't necessarily play out in this kind of context. Um, <coughs> excuse me, just turning to Siren, um, I particularly like when you talk about there being a high uh, degree of core activity in Treasury as there is in, say, FP&A or corporate accounting. But the difference, you say, is that you need to be prepared to have your day changed by real-time events that will generally require immediate or intraday actions. And you yourself, uh, as a kind of a accidental treasurer, so to speak, uh, can you tell us more about that and, um, and, and, and a little bit more about the treasury profession? And uh, as I would put it, it's somewhat more forward and externally facing profession maybe than other roles within finance. But, but what, what are your views on that, Simon? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, um, the, the, the biggest difference uh, in, in many ways is what you typically do within a treasury function has a, has a real time impact. Um, it's not it's not a situation where you can put a journal voucher through, if you like, um, because you booked something the wrong way around or you made a wrong assumption. It, it does have a real impact. I mean, what I what I suppose I mean is there's the there's the big events like um, always the the call from the CFO about an M and A transaction that you know often comes with not a huge amount of notice, um, and then you have as you know Frank was alluding to COVID nineteen, where I think you are really testing. Um, the disciplines that you've hopefully already got in place running into something like that, but you're, you're testing them in live show, if you like, which is which is important. Uh, and then there's the more sort of operational stuff, I would say, where you, you know you see sharp moves in in FX, or you see a bad headline about a particular institution, um, or you have a, a rating agency that that reacts to your set of numbers. Um, you know those, those type of aspects. I mean, you know, COVID nineteen, I think, has tested has tested everybody. So I, I won't go over that in any degree of detail. But what it what it did um, reinforce is the is the discipline of knowing who your contact points are, knowing how to get hold of them, knowing where your documents are, having them easily accessible, um, and then navigating through whatever you may need to do fairly quickly. Um, to reassure, well, to reassure both the CFO um, and the CEO, because those are the last two guys you want on your neck um, at any time. But also, the, you know, the wider board that people know what they're doing, um, and liquidity is sound, and you, you know, you have a path to navigate through. Um, one of the things I've certainly done uh, in much of my career is what I'll call dry runs. So every every year or so sort of try and sit down with one or two of the team and run through what might be a reasonable scenario or two or three scenarios and then to do the the prep work because these things when they do come into um live activity you never get enough notice you never have enough time you're deluged with documentation you're deluged with questions and board papers and and all sorts of analysis and therefore doing it relatively calmly but with realistic scenarios that you can pressure test through your your own team through your own systems um it's hugely beneficial i mean we we did a bond in um in may of, of this year um we've done some quite a bit of preparation for that it was something we were planning to do anyway before covid and covid slightly delayed it i would say uh, but also you know we've done very large acquisitions in the past and we've simulated those acquisitions you know so that we know well, what we need to do when, um, and, and that to me is that's to me is the thing that makes it most interesting. I mean, if you don't like a changing or an evolving environment, it's going to be a difficult environment probably to to succeed at the highest level in. But if you if you like change and you're happy to deal with it and you, you can keep a clear mind when things go wrong, um, 
that's that's hugely hugely beneficial. Um, you know, I, I lived in Hong Kong through the Asian crisis, and we saw interest rates spike up at sort of you know 100 type levels. And until that moment, I didn't really recognise the importance of matching the dates up on swaps um, with other coupon payments on bonds. Um, but of course, once you go through that, you certainly do recognise the importance of doing it. So. I think you know that's that's a good thing, and I, I enjoy those type of um, challenges when they emerge. Great. Well, well, there's a lot in there, a lot of great advice for people, I particularly like the, you know doing doing these dry runs. And, and so, for people who aren't as uh, easily able to deal with change or don't like it as much, at least those those, those dry runs, as, as you say, give you um, you know prepare you a little bit, and then when when something does happen. Uh, you're, you're, you're in a much better position. So, so thanks for those those pieces of advice, Simon. Now it's time to turn to Claudia because you haven't had a chance to say much yet, Claudia. But you, you know, you're working for Deutsche Bank, of course. You're also a Treasury uh, professional through and through. Uh, what would you give in terms of advice to that person coming into Treasury for the first time at a senior level? Well, I have two main recommendations. So the first one is look for a network. Um, look for your set of advisors that you can consult with and discuss new ideas. Um, you will always find someone that is going through the same issues and can tell you the do's and don'ts, uh, that can provide some assurance on whatever you are planning. Um, I, I have seen that uh, not many treasurers uh, feel comfortable about approaching their service providers, their banks, system consultants. Uh, all of them, they have the experience on whatever you're looking for. Um, they won't be always trying to sell you something, and but they will be happy to make themselves, make themselves available to you. Uh, they also know each other. So if they don't have the answer themselves, they, they can uh, put you in the right, right direction. Uh, the treasury community is very small, so everybody knows each other, even across borders. So um, try to find uh, the right people you are comfor comfortable talking to. Um, my second advice is, um, again, uh, technology, technology, technology. Um, it's not only about knowing what is in the market. It is also understanding how a system gets implemented. What are the principles and the decisions you need to make uh, from the beginning? Uh, get familiar with the concepts on how data gets consolidated, how system talks to each other, how they are integrated. Um, ask your partners like banks uh, what is available, how you can connect to them. Uh, try to understand how you can make uh, your function more efficient. Even, even if you are not planning to do the changes today, uh, try to understand what's the way uh, to go. Um, you can start uh, making, uh, contributing to a smooth implementation by standardizing some processes even before you uh, you are ready to implement a technology. So try to get familiar with where you want to go and start working in that direction. Oh, thanks very much, Claudia. Um, great pieces of advice there as well, networking and technology. Just going to move back to um, um, uh, our practicing treasurers at the moment, um, if, uh, for want of better expression, and just ask them if, um, and, and in the meantime, if, if questions come in from the audience, you know, I'll, I'll be tackling them as well. But I'd just be curious to know if there's any kind of defining moment that you could describe, something that really affected you that you could share with our audience that, that um, might be helpful to them. And I'll, I'll start with you, Frank, on that one, please. Well, one defining moment was already talked through before with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, there is a, a second, uh, I call it once a lifetime project, um, which was a spin-off from the former uh, majority shareholder um, in 2018. Um, uh, Puma there was, uh, or, or uh, Caring, who was a majority shareholder before, um, has uh, done a public offering uh, or a, a distribution in kind which led uh, to a so-called uh, change of control. And, and with this change of control, well, uh, we, we, we do have to implement a, a complete new standalone financing policy, number one. We do have to find home for um, almost 3,000 FX derivatives, which are now no longer handled with the in-house bank of our former shareholder, but 
or who do want to get to external banks. And then, as I'm also responsible for insurance uh, function, we do have to rewrite each and any insurance contract newly. Um, so th that was really a defining moment. Um, and, and you see the whole development of a treasury um, department um, well, in a quick, a quick view, uh, within a couple of months, where you have to build everything new. Um, by the way, as we talked before about about people development, about how to get the people in, how to manage that, what was one real turning idea at that time was, um, because obviously for this big project, you can handle that either going to consultants or helping yourself. Uh, we chose the second uh, version, so we brought in we brought in um, people from our subsidiaries um, outside Germany, who wanted to learn a little bit more about headquarter treasury, and we brought them in. We, at the end, we, we we ended with 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 one guy from um, Argentina and another guy from India, and we gave at least for a limited time. Um, a good chunk of um, the operational day-to-day -day business for the, uh, which we are doing in Treasury to them so that they can uh, jump into this role. And I have done, uh, and, and we have then, um, uh, uh, then pushed all the project works towards my teammates. And that was a very, very interesting time um, uh, for us because, uh, first of all, we had the help from the group. Um, secondly, we, we, um, these people who joined us have a complete different view of what we are doing there. And of course, it, it shows also quite trust to my people that we will manage that without um, expensive and extensive um, consultant and inflow. And that was a very um, interesting idea also from a perspective of career development and people development. Well, thanks very much, Frank. That, that was absolutely fascinating. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, Simon, any defining moment that, you, that you'd care to share? Yeah, I mean, I shared a little bit about the um, the Asia financial crisis. I was I was living in Hong Kong there at the time, um, and, had, and had been in post not particularly long. Um, I think that was defining in the sense that the markets became so volatile so quickly um, that it that it is a little bit nerve wracking. You know, at that stage in your career, it is very nerve wracking. And um, I, I think, from my point of view, that that led me to to look at things going forward and think. Okay, I should have done a little bit more thinking and a little bit, a little more, more curious about how things might work um, in in those events. Um, but you, but you learn from that. And I think the other one was um, RB. We we made a, a fairly significant twenty billion dollar acquisition probably three years ago now, um, where this kind of dry run preparation. We, we worked with an incredibly slim team at the center. I think there was probably four or five of us working on the, the financing. Um, me and, and, and sort of one or two others of my own team, plus a lawyer, plus an accountant. Um, just working as a very close group, keeping together, um, making sure that, you know, we didn't have any gaps between our own knowledge. And, you know, we got a, a public leak during the uh, negotiation negotiation phase of the transaction that meant everything had to be accelerated. Um, and it's, you know, again, you come back, preparation, be curious, do your reading, do your preparation, keep up to date, um, so that you really are, you really do know what you need, you know, what you need to do when these things come up. I mean, you know, time and time again, whether it's COVID-19 or an acquisition or a material disposal, these things generally don't come with sort of three months notice. Um, they come up on you incredibly quickly, um, and they are truly transformational for, for you know for for every company. You know, some better than others. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating point that, that you, you're coming back to again there, Simon, about this taking control, being prepared. So not just saying, well, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, just take it as it comes, but actually being prepared so important, and it will hold people in good stead um, through these difficult times as well, of course. Um, so thanks very much for that. We've got some questions coming in from the audience, so I'm going to turn to those as well. And um, the first question I'm, I'm going to take um, was, do the panel have any practical tips for gaining a full understanding of their new business's strategy so that as the new treasurer, you can really plug into that? So would anyone care to have that? Simon, maybe start with you? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think... Um... Most most companies, and certainly most public companies, you know, the analyst the analyst presentations are increasingly um, taped. 
Um, so they're, they're available to look back. Uh, and, and I think it comes back to this thing about doing your homework in the same way that if you were going for an interview, you'd read the annual accounts and you maybe think of a few what you think are smart questions, although probably what are really dumb questions to, to the interviewer. But I think it's, it's suck up what you can internally, try and understand the products, um, what's driving the products, try and understand the sort of financial metrics of it. But read, you know, read and listen to the big picture stuff, whether it's newspaper articles or whether it's analyst reports, because everybody comes at things with a slightly different spin. Um, you know, and you, and you need to know whether there's whether there are leverage issues that are on the horizon that you need to, you know, you, you're likely need to deal with quite quickly when you're in the job, um, or whether everything is is relatively smooth but quite unstructured, and therefore you may have to do a bit of a, a reorganisation or a reimplementation of systems uh, and and the such like. So I think read as widely as you can um, and just keep up, you know, keep up to date with what the banks are sending you. It may not be relevant today, but you know, it sure as hell will be relevant in the future. Um, so that you so that you constantly keep almost a uh, you know like today there's there's all manner of digital products that are being sold both by fintechs and obviously by banks and some of them are white labelled and some of them aren't um, and you just need to know what they are um, because they all become you know they become relevant if only to dismiss them um, but you know there's a right time and a wrong time to do some things. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Simon. Uh, Claudia, any comments on that question from yourself? Yes, maybe on my experience as a former uh, practitioner. So um, I I found very important. Uh, I, I was working in an engineering company, and uh, they were trying to explain me why they were using so many metals and commodities, etc. So we were trying to convince them to hedge. Uh, I didn't understand why it didn't make sense until I went there and saw a huge propeller for a ship and uh, understood what the technology was behind and why the commodities weren't as important as, uh, as I was thinking. So uh, go to talk to your business and understand what they are doing and, and why. And, if you, and from the bank point of view, so we have visibility over what many industries are doing. So we, we know um, not only what your peers are doing, but what other industries that have similar problems uh, have applied. So, Again, uh, networking, talk to your banks, uh, give us a call. Uh, we, we can try to find some answers for, for you. Thanks, Claudia. And I'll also pose the same um, question to Frank before we go quick fire through some of the other questions because they're all flooding in now. So, Frank, your thoughts? Uh, well, what was, a, what was a, a really eye opening event for me was doing um, such a worst case scenario. Um, together for the whole group um, with our uh, with our head of controlling, and 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 um, you should not come uh, or, or you should not tend to do this scenario analysis by your own. So you should have someone who is doing that for you. But at the end of the day, you should be so deep into it that you could explain it as it would be your own one, um, because this is triggering so many things. Um, and, and you're really learning a lot of that. Um, and that was one, uh, one major insight. Even after nine years, I'm already with the function. Um, even with this scenario analysis, I learned a lot. Thanks, Frank. Um, the next question I'll, I'll pose to you, I'll, I'll stay with you. Um, it's what is your advice on interactions with rating agencies? How often should you meet with them, maintain relationships outside a debt raising or other transaction? I have to admit, we don't have a rating, an external rating. So I'm not a good advisor on that. Yeah, so, so we'll move and then to Simon. It's just I've got a couple of special questions for Simon as well. But I think, Simon, we're going to have to focus on you for a little while now. Um, let, me, let me deal with the rating agencies one. So I think how you deal with them is um, you know, in a not dissimilar way to how you would deal with your bankers. I mean, you have to manage expectations carefully. You have to be transparent. Um, and you have to, you know, as Frank says, you have to know your numbers. Um, and you have to own the numbers. How right. often you meet them, to be honest with you, is where it depends where your rating is. For us, we tend to meet them formally once, once or twice a year, and have a dialogue with them as and when something relevant comes up, and we would share that with them, obviously. Thanks, Simon. And, and there is, uh, as I say, there's a specific question for you, Simon. Uh, how did you prepare for the M&A activity? What was crucial in showing day-to-day post-deal close? 
Um, so how, how we prepared, we had a, a corporate model. So we the corporate model, we, we kind of simulated what it might look like going through the corporate model. All the, um, <clears throat> all the DCM and loan presentations that we may have received during the preceding six months and transactions we'd observed in the market, we, we effectively created a pricing grid um, through which to negotiate the, the bridge facility. Um, and then we went to the uh, then we went to the capital market. So I think we knew we knew the markets very well. We knew people that had done similar sized deals. We'd had them pitched to us over the preceding six or twelve months. And um, you know we do keep this stuff and we do read it. Um, and putting it all together, um, that effectively enabled us a sort of a, a sheet to work through. The uh, the integration, you know, there's a there's a time and a place when you start the integration, and uh, you know when you're buying something that's already got a treasury function, they, you know, everybody knows that that function isn't going to exist for a great deal of, of time after the acquisition. So uh, myself and one of my colleagues kind of got on a plane basically, and we and we went through it with the team. And, and had a very you know transparent dialogue and it you know it worked well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now we have one question that's uh, this um, individual is saying it's key to understand the business as much as possible. Uh, should a proportion of the hundred days be dedicated to understanding um, the, the business as much as possible? And I think we have said it absolutely. Um, and another question coming in though then says, does the boss agree you take the time to do all the horizon scanning and keeping up to date? Um, so I just wondered what you might say on that, Simon, before we move over for, for Frank's view. I probably have a fairly um, blunt response in many ways to that. I mean, I, I do take the view that there are there are 24 hours in a day and there are seven days in a week. And generally, most people are working for five days a week and 12 hours. So I think it's um, there's an awful lot of stuff you can do around that. And, and you know, you have to do a lot more in your own time as you as you go up. Um, to, to prepare yourself, does does my boss um, think it's a good use of my time? Well, hell yes, um, because you know there is no shortage of people trying to benchmark or reference check what you do once you've done it. So you want to be really sure going into it that you've got the best deal you can for the company. And you know we, we take we take a lot of pride in that. Um, you know it has to be a fair transaction, but you do need to know the market. Um, and we've gone we've gone through that a few times, and I think that investment in time and most of it is you know I will accept a lot of our own time um, is is really well worth it. And I think it's good career progression. I think it's good you know professional development, mm. uh, and it gets you closer to your banks. And that's you know those are all good things. Absolutely. Thanks, Simon. Now, Frank, uh, this question is: any tips for those stepping up internally? deputy to group treasurer, e.g. change in behaviour when dealing direct with the CFO. What would you say to that, Frank? Well, it's a funny one because I, uh, in my previous role with my previous company, I have done exactly this, um, stepping up from a deputy position into a group treasurer's position. Um, uh, but, but, but uh, well, uh, I think the more interesting, uh, the interesting, well, uh, a thing to manage is more how do you deal with your former teammates? Um, your CFO had had a good word in letting you step up. Um, so why should you why should you talk to him very much differently than you have talked before? And of course, there is one thing where you should always be aware of: um, being a group treasurer, the CFO is not only asking um, uh, it's not only asking about functional specifics. Being a group treasurer is also he, he seeks your advice. So you have to step up into this strategic role and, and have to check with the CFO, how much do I want, uh, do you want me to get into this strategic role? That is maybe the only change towards your superior, your CFO. Um, and, and, and that is, of course, something which you have to address because that is a, a, a good, a, a normal expectation everybody could have from a group treasurer. But, but it is more interesting also how you deal with your teammates before. Um, that there, there you have to be quite careful um, in that regard, um, and, and, and then it will work. Indeed. Thanks, Frank. And Claudia, you've seen a lot of uh, what works and doesn't work in the Treasury world. Do you have any comments on, on this particular point? Um, regarding the Treasurer, the, um, the Beauty Treasury is stepping up. Um, I think something that you need to acknowledge uh, is you will feel uncomfortable at the beginning, but then it will come natural, right? So it's uh, just uh, practice. 
Yeah, no, it's an interesting one. And as a, as a former musician, I, I always say, you know, practice, practice, practice. And there's a great book by Herminia Ibarra, Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. And it, sometimes you just have to act, you sometimes just have to do, and then you become. Um, now, I know we're um, nearing the end. We're just running over a few minutes because we started slightly late. Um, and there's uh, quite a number of um, questions uh, coming in, but we've got time just for, for this last one before we close off. And this one says, what is the best approach you've come across to be fair on share of wallet and manage bank relationships? Um, so perhaps um, I could turn to Simon to take that one, please. Thanks very much, Caroline. That's very good of you. Um, I think, look, I think, um, I think you, 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 you have to recognise if you've got a core group of banks, you try and, you know, you have to try and allocate the, um, the wallet as fairly as you practically can, recognising that, you know, many banks can't do everything. Um, so there is always a bit of a, of a skew um, in that. But you, but you have to be, um, you have to be fair, you have to listen. Uh, we, you know, we sit down with our banking group formally once a year to go through the um, the state of play, if you like, and the relationship, what's gone well, what's gone badly, what their return is. And we, you know, the, the banks that we deal with, we will have a very um, open and transparent conversation. We can't, we can't please everybody all the time. I mean, that's just, that is just the reality of life. And both sides of the table know that. And no matter how much you give, people will always want more. Um, so it, it is a question of the balance, to be very candid, but but also trying to accommodate and help people where you can, because everybody's trying to do a job here, um, and we and we both have completely aligned goals. Um, we just have different taskmasters. So you know, to try and to try and get that balance is, you know, you've got to know first of all how much you actually think they're making off the relationship before you can really have a sensible dialogue. So we you know we do our own share of wallet calculation and we ascribe values to certain things and and we try and match it up with two or three of our of our banks where we have large flow business um, to make sure we're directionally there. Um, but no it's it's transparency and trying to share the opportunities. It's not you know it's not easy to be candid but it's um but it's part of the job. Well thanks very much Simon for that. Um very, very helpful. And I'm sorry we don't have time to um, cover all the questions today. But Simon, um, you know, your 15 second last piece of advice, a word that you'd like to share with the audience, please. Yeah, I think, um, well, obviously, read the book, uh, read, read the guide, I suppose, is the, is the <laughs> first thing. Um, look after your, you know, be curious, um, read as widely as you can. And I, and I think we've all said pretty much the same thing in, in different ways. Take all the information you possibly can um and sift out what you can't use today and and use what you can and have a view try and try and develop a view thanks very much simon frank your final words well it, it goes into the same direction one thing which is very very important for us here um, is um, be super strategic consistent um, and transparent on your approach you're doing towards your partners. Is it banks? Is it fintechs? Is it whoever? So be transparent and communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, and, and that is how you manage that um, to the best of in your internal partners, but also your external partners. And, read the, and read the book. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And communication is so key. We focus on that a lot in our um, in our qualifications and uh, other areas of the ACT, because if you can't communicate, uh, then you might as well not have bothered really. If people don't understand what you have to say, uh, Claudia, your final words. Maybe um, with regards to communication. So sometimes we also need to listen to you. So uh, most of the time we come with uh, with a lot of information. What's there? But uh, sometimes you should also educate us and let us understand your needs, your business, so that we can offer uh, the right products, the right uh, advice. Um, so talk to us more. Uh, let us prepare for the meetings by providing more information that would be uh, that would enrich the the communication uh, in all the meetings. Thanks very much, Claudia. So we're going to close in just a few moments. Um, but just I'd like to thank my uh, three panelists. 
very much for uh, today. It's been a great pleasure and I've learned a lot as well. And uh, thanks also again to Deutsche Bank for supporting us on this project. And I hope you'll agree that um, the, the look and feel of the uh, document is absolutely fabulous. Um, just before we go, don't forget to fill out feedback on the webinar. Also, if, um, uh, if you'd like to, if you haven't yet registered, we have our um, upcoming uh, annual conference next week. So I hope you will be able to join us there, a fantastic platform. And we hope to um, be able to encourage networking, get people just away from the grind and the day to day. I know it's another virtual event, but really we need to communicate with each other. So there's some great um, networking uh, possibilities on this platform. So do join us for that. We've also got the Middle East to Treasury Summit and Awards coming up. I know a lot of you on the call um, are based out of the Middle East, so please do um, look, look at joining us there. And we've got other upcoming events, um, as you can see here. So um, without further ado, thank you so much. And also, if you're interested more about communication and the softer skills, do look at our um, uh, Strategic Insights podcast, where every week I, um, from my coaching background, share a few words um, of things that you can implement tomorrow that will maybe, uh, will hopefully make a change to your, your career and your life. Um, but thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, and it's goodbye from ACT Cyberspace, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye.